testing this hack and learn in collaboration with Inspire Matrices in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and colleagues from the South African Medical Research Council. Before we started, as you might have heard, this uh, session is being recorded and we will make it available uh, in case you want to listen again and get all the insight and the juicy things that will be said and shared. So welcome again, everyone. My name is Mare Rotti. I am the academic director here at Government Outcomes Lab at the University of Oxford. We've been hosting the Hack and Learn for uh, several years now. Uh, and we host them for data enthusiasts like us, who wants to use data to create better outcomes. In the call today, uh, we have uh, some of the people who participated or in, the, in the challenge over the past two weeks. And we also have James and Lima from Open Data Services, who throughout the Hack and Learn, uh, you saw them waving, uh, throughout the Hack and Learn have provided us with a technical support to turn some crazy idea in something that is uh, that can be developed. So they were the one giving us ideas and also imposing some constraints in terms of uh, impossible. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, the, in the show and tell session, what we do is we tell a story of what we've been doing in the past uh, two weeks. And uh, we also have uh, somebody who volunteers to offer some uh, feedback to get us going in terms of uh, uh, maybe taking forward some of, of those ideas. And today we uh, have the privilege of having uh, Elaine with us. Elaine is a postdoc research associate at the Government Outcomes Lab. Her interest is into understanding what is the role of innovative financing to improve social outcomes. This was part of her field in the previous publication of research. And at the GoLab, she is a lead researcher on the evaluation of the Life Chances Fund for those of you familiar with the outcome bonds uh, in the social impact bonds in the UK. In terms of expertise, she applied macroeconomist and uh, she does uh, policy research. Uh, she has special interest in health and social policy, and, but uh, the innovative financing mechanism is one of the things that she really uh, distinguished herself. So we're really lucky to have her, uh, her view here today and uh, helping us improve what we do as a researcher and policy analyst. Do you want to say hello, Elaine? So Hi everyone, see. nice to be here. It's my first um, Hack and Learn, so very excited to be here and thanks for the invitation today. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, before we get started, can I ask you all to make sure that the, your camera stays on? We are um, a friendly group and uh, we intentionally organize this session as a Zoom call so we can see each other as if we belong to the same team because we do belong in the, in the same team. Indigo is a data collaborative and so it belongs to us all. And if you could, um, please also uh, check that the name, if you change uh, the name, you will have your first name and surname in the Zoom profile so we know who you are. That would be great. I'll uh, start off with, uh, as you see here is our agenda. This is my welcome. We will uh, give you a summary of what the Hack and Learn event is and Juliana will lead on this. Then we will go into presenting the challenges. We have two challenges and uh, the leaders of these challenges will tell us what happened. At the end of each challenge, Elaine will uh, provide some comments and then I will open up um, for uh, Q&As for uh, everybody. And if you have time, stay online because after the Hack and Learn, we have the tradition of having a little social event. So I'll stop here and I'll pass it over to you, Kuli. Great, Mara, thank you. Well, this is for the people who are joining this event for the first time. And what I want to do is to explain a little bit what we did in these past two weeks. The, the, the Hack and Learn is an international event where a group of practitioners, policymakers, and data enthusiasts get together to work on some very complex problems using data and trying to solve these problems using data and evidence, mostly collected by the Indigo Initiative or the GoLab or any other source of data and information. We started our event on the 13th of September, two weeks ago, 
just before the social outcomes conference with our kickoff session. In that session, we all got together and we presented the different challenges. I presented my challenge and Harry presented his challenge. And we made two different groups of people who wanted to work for that particular problem. We created two Slack chats. We have been using Slack very intensively. Uh, that's where all the communication and happens. We have been having discussions. Some of us met on Zoom in the past weeks. And today is the show and tell session. Today is the moment when we get together again and we share what we did. We share the outputs of our challenges. We, we know that two weeks is very little time. We don't expect anybody here to come with a final solution to any of these complex challenges, but we do expect to see some learning happening. We, we really want to share the learning and to see what are the potential next steps and how we can keep working to address these challenges. Um, as Mar was saying, after the show and tell session, we will have a social session. Everybody has to come with something indigo. It could be a piece of clothing, it could be anything else. And the winner will receive the indigo cup. And uh, yeah, I know we are um, we have a packed agenda, so it's back to you, Mara. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana. I'll, um, I guess I'll pass the floor directly to Harry, who is going to present our first challenge which is called Show Me The Money. I asked Harry to keep it uh, within like just over 10 minutes. And after he presented the challenge, Elaine will uh, provide some immediate feedback. Harry, over to you. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much, Mara, and hi, everyone. So yeah, we were uh, running Challenge 31. This was me and Jonathan Ung at USAID were, were the co-leads on this session. And the question we were trying to answer, which is on the next slide, is uh, what type of capital is used in impact bonds? So in a way, it's a simple question, but as we found, it was uh, it soon became a more complex question as we made our way through the challenge. Um, and this was a question that Jonathan uh, had originally put to us because he was interested in how complex the, the funding arrangements are in impact bonds, what maybe the implications of some of that complexity could be. We use the language of investment, but really it's quite unclear whether this is we're talking about equity we're talking about debt are they more like grant arrangements are there are there complications going on that we don't really know about so we were trying to get some clarity on this matter so with the next slide then it just summarizes the three strands that we had in our approach to the challenge so first let's look at the existing data in the indigo impact bond data set find out what information we already have two uh, let's have a, a document search strategy. So look in existing publications to see if we could find any more information. And then the third strand was what we call the human intel strategy. And this was to try and talk to stakeholders, people involved in these projects and ask really if they could give us more information about this matter of how the finances is, is organized and structured. So I'll just go through it in order of those three strands and tell you what we got up to and tell you what we what we came came across. So going on to the first, uh, the next slide. So we had 38 projects with data on the type where the type of capital was recorded. And actually this was more than we thought we had. So that was in a way a nice start to see that we had it for 38. Uh, and the options that could be recorded there our, in our variable in the data was debt, equity, or a combination of the two. Uh, and so it was good we have the data, but the first immediate finding was that those three categories were insufficient to capture the diversity and variation in what has, was actually being recorded. So if we go on to the next slide, here is just a sample of some of the variations in terminology that were recorded there, and indeed our reaction to them. So. The, the, and this isn't even the whole list, right? So we were seeing things like investment with debt characteristics. Okay, so that seems like sort of both aspects of both a convertible loan, something that starts as a loan, but then can be turned into equity, um, quasi equity, deferred fees, philanthropic investment. So and, and as I say, this isn't all there were others as well. And so the first issue is what do all these mean? Can they be categorized as debt or equity or something else? Um, and how does that add up ultimately in, in terms of the breakdown on the numbers? So Georgie, who's on the call, did that for us. He looked up definitions. He made the call on whether these could be categorized under grant or uh, under equity or debt and drew up a pie chart, which is on the next slide. So this is the initial, initial findings from the existing data. So you can see one 
how big the gap in the knowledge is insofar as 86% of projects we have no information on. So we would, we're dealing with a, a relatively small slice of the projects. And within that largest proportion were debt and then followed by a combination of equity and debt. Uh, and we also, you'll see there the other strand, and that was for those terms that Georgie decided he couldn't, he, he, they didn't fit in either equity or debt. So we're just left with these, this category of other. Um, so there's a few there as well. On the combination, it's worth saying, the ones that are equity and debt combined, one question that is unanswered is the proportion of each. It could be 10% equity, it could be 90%. And those are, those would be quite different things in terms of how, how it functioned within the, the impact bonds. So that was another unanswered question. Uh, so moving on then, we had the document search strategy. So here we gathered some official evaluations of impact bonds on the, the sort of the sense that they might be the best uh, publications in terms of providing additional information on this. So we thought, let's start there. So we gathered a few of those. Uh, a couple of us did search. We didn't get through the whole list. There was more than 70, but of the of the 20 or so that we did a search through, um, we didn't get much luck, it has to be said. We would come and get up against phrases that would indicate or hint at an aspect of the of the the structure of the of the financing, but not with enough clarity for us to make a decision on whether it was debt or equity or something else. So for these quotes are just a couple of small examples to indicate that. There was one um, paper that had a breakdown of a number of different impact bond projects, and it had investment information, but under that heading for the, the investor, it said senior investor stroke lender. So already that's indicating both equity or, or debt, but there was no, no, no greater distinction than that. It just had them together, so it didn't allow us to say either way. And then just another example, this re referred to a uh, big society capital, originally invested in the SIB in order to help it become established with a view to selling its investment stake. So hmm, this, this feels like that probably means equity, but we also know that debts can be sold between organizations. So it could also be another way of saying they were just gonna sell the debt that they had. So we, again, too much of a question mark over it to be able to be confident. So mm, a little bit tricky on the document search strategy. It sort of indicates that where, where people are writing about this, it's not really being made clear, the sort of detail that we were looking for. Uh, so that leaves us with the human intelligence strategy. Now, a word on this first was we thought, let's let's get, draw up a list of stakeholders and then send out our group to go and contact them all. But as Sri rightly pointed out, this actually would possibly be in breach of data protection. So first of all, we had to say, well, let's maybe not do that. We don't want to share contact details uh, publicly. So we still did draw up a list. We at the Go Lab, since we know these people, we have their contacts, will still follow up on those contacts and, and, and try and get more information. And no doubt we can report back in, in the blog or so on how that goes. But luckily it didn't, that didn't stop us completely because we had Phil, he was our man on the inside, so to speak. He was he he has worked on many of these impact bonds, and through his contacts, was able to provide us with the data for an additional fifty four projects. So more than doubling the um, the number of projects that we had this information on. So this was absolutely great. Um, and I think the next slide should possibly be the new pie chart. Yeah. So then we updated the pie chart with this new data uh, with the same categories. And as you can see here, the, the majority of those were also debt. They were sort of recorded as loans, which we took to, to mean debt. There were some equity and combinations as well. So they've also increased, but, but it was, as you see, proportionally, it's a big chunk increase in those that are classified uh, as debt. So we were sort of left with more questions regarding this, because the, as I say, they're recorded as, as loans. Uh, that perhaps does indicate that these aren't traditional investments as they are slightly talked about as. But then we thought, are they are they conventional repayable loans? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and so, the, yeah, well, I've, I've skipped over the first question. So I guess if the first question is, is around all these different uh, var variations that we've seen in terms of the terminology that's used, 
differences, small differences in detail, do they require different categories? So this, I think, is something for the data team uh, at GoLab to have a think about whether we need more than just this debt equity combination and, and need further, further breakdown than that. Possibly that's the case. And yeah, so the, the the point about the loans and whether they're conventional loans or whether they're not, whether there's, it's like a loan with a government guarantor or so, we're interested in this because it seems to have implications for risk and where the risk falls among the different stakeholders involved. The traditional uh, use case or, or in theory, the, the, the theoretical use case of the impact bond says, you know, the risk is transferred to the private sector. But I think based on what we've seen, it's maybe not always the case that risk is entirely held by the by the private sector. Um, and furthermore, a point that Mara made was that sometimes a loan can behave like equity if all of the risk is on the, the organization that made the loan. And sometimes equity can behave more like a debt if it has full guarantee by an additional organization, for example. So then again, it's not it's still not clear of which depend on which term we've categorized it as, it's still not clear where the risk is lying within that. So if that was to become formulated as a question that requires further, further investigation, it might be who is making loans to who and what happens if the SIB is not successful and does not trigger payment? Where, where does the, the risk lie in terms of covering the cost of a, of a failure to meet those indicators? Um, so yeah, that's where we got. It's more more questions than answers, but I think it was good because we we got well, we increased the amount of data we had in the data set first of all uh, through Phil, and then we've also you know maybe direct direct have a couple of avenues for further direction now. Whether it's thinking about coming up with a uniform classification for some of these var variations, or whether it's I don't know do, having a bit of a research stream that digs into the risk allocation within these partnerships. Uh, so I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Harry. It seems like a simple question to start with, a uh, simple classification. Uh, and always you find uh, things that are more complicated than you start with. But I think this will increase the clarity also in our glossary, maybe. Uh, so I can already see some low hanging fruit on uh, how our uh, data is improving uh, on the back of this. Um, Elaine, can I come to you if you have uh, comments on this challenge? And for everybody else, please feel free to put uh, comments or uh, raise your hand uh, on the chat. Uh, I'll come to you after we've uh, heard the second challenge as well for the open Q&A. Elaine. Thanks very much. And thanks very much, Harry, for, for that interesting, for those interesting slides. I think it's a really interesting area and um, unfortunately it's such, such um, difficult, a difficult area to get further information from. And I, I'm curious to know why um, it is so difficult to get good information on. You know, these, I know there's a balance between commercial, is it because it's commercially sensitive information, but you know, as researchers, we there's a balance between that kind of information and trying to enhance the evidence base as to what works and how to structure for the future impact bonds and how we can understand the best way to fund public services. So from a research perspective, um, sometimes I get a little frustrated at the, the lack of transparency in this information. And it, it and it's really interesting to see that, you know, with with the with the man on the inside, you can um, you can get an additional that additional um, information from eight from without information from eighty percent to sixty percent. So that's quite incredible that some of this information can because it's not transparent, it's quite opaque. It kind of sits at the sits at the individual level, and I'm wondering whether there's a whether there's a better way forward in terms of having more transparent information. Um, I agree with the issues around terminology. Um, there's there's a lot of different gray areas, how do you classify debt? How do you classify some of the equity, um, some of the equity um, structures in there? And I agree that it's a little, it, it may need a bit more granularity in terms of how we, how we categorize um, some of these things. And um, in, 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 in the space of innovative financing, some of these, um, some of these structures are sort of used in some projects in isolation, but when you multiply layers and layers of that in an impact bond, um, it, it, it does make things really complex. So 
I guess as a researcher, I'm interested in understanding what drives certain impact bonds to be structured in this particular way. Uh, what, as you alluded to, what this does to the risk profile level, um, whether there'd be more or less investment if they were structured any differently, and what 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 sort of what what um how would how could we take some of these learnings to structure future impact bonds? What works and if we structure them slightly differently to, to capture a different risk profile level, could we generate more capital and, and, and um, appeal to further investment? So uh, what works and in what context and under what conditions? So a lot of, I've just added to your questions list there, um, but yeah, really, really important area. And I, I really think it's um, really great to, to try to document this and to, to generate a bit more data on this. Thanks. Harry, if you want, you want to come back on anything at this moment, or uh... fine. So I'll uh, move us along to our uh, next uh, challenge. Um, Juliana is presenting it. We have been shown the money, and uh, Juliana will show us the outcome. Fully. Thanks, Mara. Uh... The title of this challenge was Show Me the Outcomes, Rethinking Changes and Adaptations in Social Impact Bonds. And if we go to this next slide, we will see what was our main question when we just started. We really wanted to understand how do social impact bonds adapt to unexpected challenges? And we started with this question because before the Hack and Learn, together with the Indigo team, we were doing some work on data on performance. And when I say performance of social impact bonds, I mean outcome payments and outcome achievements. And we wanted to have an idea of what were the expectations at the beginning of the project and what was the achievement at the end of the project. And we thought that with those two figures, we would have a good idea of how the project performed. But then we realized that projects can change many times during the life of service delivery. So it was not very clear to us which was the best benchmark to use. Is it the figure that you have at the beginning of the project? Is it a, fi is it a figure that you have at the middle in the middle of the life of the project? Is this the latest renegotiation? We really didn't know, and there was no agreement in the community. So we decided that this was a question worth exploring. If you go to the next slide, uh, we realized that we had a bit of a problem because the Indigo Impact Bond database does not capture changes over time. So this is how uh, uh, me and the rest of the data stewards and data officers work with the Impact Bond data set. The Impact Bond data set is designed to always show you the latest value of a project. So for example, if a project is supposed to, to work with 100 people, but then they decide to change and they prefer to work with 200 people, I or Sri or Eve or Malu will go to the database and we'll put 200 in the place where it used to say 100. So we don't keep track of the changes. You will, you will always see the latest value that we know of. And this is a bit tricky because we are not tracking the changes over time. And the only way of understanding the, the whole life of these projects is tracking the changes. We realized that we had a problem and we wanted to address it in one of our hack and learn challenges. In the next slide, I will explain you a bit more uh, how we think of this problem. This is what our spreadsheet or template to collect data looks like at the moment. And you will see that we have different rows and every row is supposed to take one outcome metric. So for example, at the moment, our data model assumes that you always have one outcome metric, one target for that outcome metric, one price for that outcome metric, and one validation method for that particular outcome metric. That's what ideally would happen. That's what theory would say about outcome metrics. However, what really happens is what we will see in the next slide. Sometimes one metric can have two targets. So maybe there is a project uh, where unemployed people were trying to were trained to get better jobs. And maybe at the beginning, the target was 500 people, but maybe later it was 200 people. So for one metric, we may need to record two targets. And maybe that achievement at the beginning was paid with 100 pounds. And maybe later it was paid with 150. And maybe later it was paid with 200 pounds per achievement. So one metric can have more than, two, more than one target and more than one price. And this is something that actually happens. So we decided that we needed to find a way to keep track of this. In the next slide, I will tell you a bit more what we do or what we did. We discussed 
different things. First of all, we came up with the typology of changes because we thought the first you need to identify what are the changes that you want to keep track of. So we built the typology of changes. And then we realized that there were too many changes for this two week work. So we built a table of priorities, which I will show you later. So we decided that there are some changes that were more relevant than others to start working with. And then we came up with the list of use cases where we each person in the team share the, their own use case and they explain why they think that this data is important and how they would use it in the future. And finally, we had a set of calls with uh, the whole team to, uh, to start thinking of potential approaches to amend the data model. So in the next slide, what I want to show is uh, our table of priorities. So you have very different changes that could happen in a social impact bond such as changes in outcome metrics, changes in outcome metric targets, changes in prices, in payment timings, changes in the cohort of beneficiaries, and many more changes. But then each of us had to give a start to at least two changes because it was impossible for us to spend two weeks thinking of all these changes. So we gave some starts to the changes that we thought were more relevant. And the winners were the changes in outcome metric targets and the changes in cohort beneficiaries. And that's what we started thinking with James and Elima. In the next slide, I want to show you some use cases that we thought of, uh, and, and they were coming from very different places. Some use cases were coming from the evaluation perspective, and this is a, a quote from Gabriel, one of our participants, and he was really interested in understanding how different aspects of, a, of an outcome metric can change during the life of the project. Because from the evaluator perspective, you really need to know everything that happened to make sure that social impact is properly measured. In the next slide, we will have a use case of a, from a research perspective, and this is a quote from Shirley. And Shirley was uh, telling us that as a researcher, she's really interested in understanding how, uh, how can a data model represent the complexity of social impact bond projects, given that there is such a polarized debate around them. Some people think that they are great to facilitate collaboration and innovation, and some other people are more concerned about uh, complexities and high transaction cost. Well, for, from a research perspective, it's good to understand the whole story. Some other use cases were coming from a, a funding office, officer perspective. And we have a quote from Phil here, who really wants to use this data to build an understanding of when to use a sieve and when to use a different form of contract. And the final use case that I want to share is a use case that comes from, a, from the perspective of a performance manager. Uh, who was telling us that it was key to have some kind of standardization of the changes across the life of the program, because otherwise you don't know how to use the data that is coming from the program to actually inform delivery and to help the people on the ground. With these use cases and this uh, table of changes and priorities, we started having different chats with James and Elima, and we came up with some prototypes and then the discussion evolved into something else, which was very, very interesting, at least to me. Uh, but I will give it, uh, I will pass it on to James so he can tell you a bit more about the prototypes. Hello, uh, next slide, please. So yes, uh, I'm afraid there's less fun pictures now, but hopefully this will be interesting. Uh, so recently we have actually done some work to uh, capture the change over time. Uh, so we, we thought about the special case of capturing the change in payment plan over time, and we've made a data visualization uh, to show the different plans for that over the lifetime of the project. Uh, but now we're considering how to track changes over time for any variable. Next slide, please. So the basic idea is that for any, for any value, you can have multiple values and attach a date range of valid from and valid to to each value. So for instance, if the target changed in March 2017, you can say that the old value of 200 was valid until March 2017, and the new value of 300 was valid afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, but it's also important to allow the dates to be uncertain um, because for, so say for example, uh, there were some yearly published reports and between the 2017 report and the 2018 report, the value changed. So we know the value changed sometime during the year, but we don't know exactly when in the year. Uh, so we thought about ways it was possible to uh, express overlapping dates to express this uncertainty when recording the data. Next slide, please. Uh, it's very important to make it uh, simple for people who are using the data. Uh, so it could be possible to download a version of the project with just the last value that is valid. 
uh, it could be possible to download a version of a project with just the value that is valid at a particular date you're interested in. Uh, although in that case, we should make sure we highlight that you might be looking at old data. Uh, and we also have to think about the cases there where there may be some uncertainty about when the value changed. Uh, and we just have to accept that there may be some uncertainty around the dates. Uh, we could also add a new tab to the spreadsheet um, with a summary of the changes over time. So uh, someone can easily see that. Uh, next slide, please. We could also, when you're using Excel, we can also use Excel comments. So when you first download the project, you just see the latest value or the, the value at a time. Uh, but in the comments, you can see the detail. So you start with a, a sort of simple view to start with the details there for you to look into if you want. And finally, for a project, we could generate uh, a nice little timeline of all the dates on which values changed so that someone can see straight away an overview uh, which dates are important to look at and when changes happened. Next slide, please. Uh, it's also important to make it simple for people who are contributing data. We know people can be put off by complex, spread, complex spreadsheets uh, and complex words. Uh, so to help this, we already have a simple project spreadsheet with less fields. Uh, and also we have the ability to delete tabs from normal project spreadsheets and it will still work when you import that back into the system. Um, so for the change over time, we think people could carry on using the current project spreadsheets and just put in one value. Um, if they know the value has changed over time, they can tell the data stewards when they sent the spreadsheet back. Uh, under this model, it's then up to the data stewards to handle the complexity of putting the right values against the dates, uh, but we think that's okay to ask them to look at that. Next slide, please. And so I won't go into the details here, but just to say we thought about uh, how data stewards could use more complicated spreadsheets with valid from and valid to fields. Uh, and these, these spread, and if there was a data contributor who was happy with this level of complexity, they could also use this spreadsheet too as well. Next slide, please. But this only captures what has changed. And one of the things that came out from the group discussions is also very important to capture why things have changed and also why one change may then lead to changes in other areas of the project. So we discussed using sources and notes fields. Uh, we discussed uh, using documents. Uh, you can attach uh, a link to a document to a project. Um, and notes notes fields that may be hard to read lots of text, so a document might be better for that. Uh, we discussed recording narratives around these changes. And maybe to highlight these to people who are looking at the data, maybe we could do things like including the documents with the data downloads uh, to make them really easy to get to. Next slide, please. So, and the other question really came up is, is it worth changing the data model? So only 30 projects have detailed information at the moment. Maybe we could just record some notes about these 30 projects instead. But do we want to make it normal that people think about how projects change over time and encourage people to record this where it happens elsewhere? Because the data definitions for the Indigo project set expectations. They, they help, uh, they set expectations of how people should think about projects, how, how they can think about the data around the projects and what data is important to others. So therefore it's important to make sure that they're a very good and realistic model. Do we want to capture data in a standard form that can be compared and used to make data visualizations like the multiple payment plans uh, visualization I showed you at the start? And is it important to capture qualitative or quantitative data or both? If quantitative, are we making sure we're using the right data definitions to collect a full and honest picture of the complex reality of projects? Because it's easy for people to see a, a bit of basic data and jump to conclusions that may not be accurate or may not capture the full complexity of projects. And so we need to make sure we're collecting the right data fields uh, that allow the full and accurate picture of a project to be described. And as in previous slides, it's also important to make sure that the data model is easy to use and easy to contribute to. Um, and so, yeah, and, and so finally, these questions really are uh, starting to think about the central uses of the Indigo project, uh, its ambitions, its goals, uh, and really starting to get to um, the heart of what a data standard can actually be useful for. And I think this is a really interesting conversation, uh, and I'm glad it started, and I'm looking forward to carrying on after this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, it's incredible to see what's happening with the performance data, and every time 
I need to remind myself the long journey we've been on and the being able to have access to performance data is a, is a great advance in this sector, but it's great that we are uh, uh, coming up with the right uh, granularity. This will, be, this will be a fantastic asset for uh, policy analysts and uh, researchers alike. I'll uh, pause because the comments are for uh, Elaine. We are back to you. If you, you you have another like up to five minutes to comment on this uh, challenge, and then I, I open up for um, Q and A. Elaine. Thanks very much for that. I, I'm a big fan of Indigo. I think it's uh, like Mara said, a wonderful asset, and it's not just. It's not just collating data. Data is so much more complicated than that. There are so many stakeholders who use it, as Juliana alluded to, and uh, just balancing everybody's interests and how they use it um, and everybody's needs and um, uses are valid. So just quite a complex project and, and, and some of those questions about how you capture the data, how you standardise it. Um, because obviously, you know, anyone can see the, the same numbers, but interpret them very differently. So um, I think we have a responsibility there to, to ensure that, um, like it was mentioned, that, you know, we, we, we develop a full accurate picture of, of, some, of some of the results. Um, and I think it's no surprises that the um, changes in outcome metrics and the changes in the cohort of beneficiaries were the, were the main things um, that change across time. And I think as an evaluator, it's really important to, to document some of these things. I know uh, I was talking to someone else about their development impact bond and they said that we do not change any, we, our, and none of our metrics have changed at all. We, we, don't, we, don't, we, we, we make sure that they're selected in a particular way that we don't, it, it has not deviated since we started. Um, and, you know, there are obviously a lot of different projects along that spectrum, some that might change a bit, that some might, some might not change. So it's really important to document that to understand why some of these projects are changing. Um, are we not considering the full set of factors when we're negotiating the impact bond? Are we selecting the appropriate targets? Um, why are the cohort of beneficiaries changing? Is it because we can't we can't actually access that beneficiary group or um, are, are other people eligible? So I think it's really important to, to map this out for, for future learnings. But um, I think it's a wonderful asset. And I think, um, yeah, I think trying to capture those things in a simple way, because we all know that Excel spreadsheets scare off a lot of people. Um, and um, I think what was presented, I think you guys have really thought about this so carefully that the trying to make it really simple for the user, but then using the data stewards um, expertise to try to develop that and embed it more into the model is 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 a, is a great approach. Um, but I, I really liked how you've got that really um, target documentation of the dates and the timelines for the dates and, and documenting that level of information, but trying to simplify that um, from the user to, um, to the data stewards. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. It is true, we shouldn't forget that some people are intimidated from spreadsheets. I put my shopping list on the spreadsheet, my recipes, so I adjust quantities of ingredients, but not everybody is so nerdy. Um, and I really appreciate your points on learning. It's true, when there is a change in the contract, probably there was something that was not anticipated, and it's great to draw attention on what is the cause of changes. And that was part of this challenge. One of the things that uh, reassured me in a way was the reason for the changes. Because often when we talk about, oh, there is a change in the contract, uh, there is always a fear that uh, it was a sort of expression of an opportunistic behavior. That somebody's like, oh, I made a bid in this contract, but then I negotiated down, which might be the case, of course. But uh, talking to people who work on this contract, there is a change of counterpart, people living, and there is a change of circumstances. So very often, those are a very reasonable uh, explanation that it would be good to anticipate and uh, prepare for. So I open up to the Q&A and uh, to break the ice and to stay on this challenge to start with, I wonder if I can call upon Petro because uh, she has been involved in uh, making sense of our data model on how to report outcome information. So do you have comments on uh, this particular challenge and uh, on reporting uh, changes? How do you feel about it? And I'm putting Jonathan on, uh, I'm preparing Jonathan because I've come to Jonathan 
after uh, to comment on the show me the money. Pedro. So I have two hats that I'm wearing. One of them is a data steward, but I'm also the performance manager for the Imagine SIP in South Africa which is um, focusing on young women and girls, and we've been implementing it now for six months. What we find now is that when we were looking at the coverage that we've put, that the targets was informed by the information that was available at that point in time. And even this morning, we had a meeting where we were looking at, for instance, PrEP coverage, which is the pre-exposure prophylaxis that's given to young women. And we are six months into implementation. We are sitting with a coverage rate of 566%. <laughs> so, you know, it means that um, when we made our assumptions in terms of the data that was available on what the uptake, for instance, of prophylaxis would be amongst young women and girls, um, we either didn't have the correct information as a um, that informed those assumptions, or there's something else that has happened that is now perhaps a very good implementation strategy that has now increased the uptake. And now we are sitting six months into it with a PrEP coverage of 566%. You know, so um, this is a very good example for me on how do we make sure that we reflect that if we now change the target when we are talking about coverage. Um, but um, I, I mean, it's early days for us, six months into implementation um, means that we will probably have to learn from all the experts that's on uh, on the call um, to see how we can, you know, do it better or differently next time, perhaps. Thank you, Petra. It's always refreshing to hear the experience of performance manager on the call. Uh, Jonathan. You were involved in challenge uh, number 31. Did we show you the money? You are muted. Do we have the power of unmute, uh, Jonathan? We don't have the power. Well, I'm afraid you will have to put your comments in the chat. <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan. Okay. Do you do we have any other uh, comments on reflection, especially for uh, challenges we didn't participate in? I have a comment, Mara, but it's uh, about my challenge, and I just wanted to reflect on what Petro said, because I think it's a fantastic example of why narratives and answer the why question is so important here. Because imagine that many years have passed and you have full access to all of the data coming from the imaginative. And the only thing that you see is that there was a target at one point, and after six months, they decided to change the target. You really don't know why that happened. And your first intuition is to think that something a bit dodgy happened there with the targets. And that's what we all think when we see changes without explanation. But if you hear Petra's explanation, then it it, it becomes totally it, it, it becomes totally logical that they would change the targets because they learned better, they had better assumptions, and they access more data and more information on, on the program that they are trying to deliver. So if you share the data together with the narrative on why they changed the target, it makes total sense. And sometimes if you share the data with no narrative and no explanation of what happened behind those changes, then people can misunderstand the, the, the data and people can make reach wrong conclusions about Petro's project. And I think at the end of the day, we're always speaking about the responsibility of the people like us putting data out there for others to consume. And, and I think this is a fantastic case to to work that works as an example of why it's really important to think of how to incorporate the narratives here. Yeah. But all this to say that thank you very much, Pedro. I think that was a fantastic example. Thank you so much, Juli. I'll try my luck again with uh, Jonathan. 
you manage. I think so. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> okay. You got to love technology until you, until you don't. Um, just to yeah, go back to that first challenge uh, again, thanks to Harry and, and, and the whole team for taking that on and um, kind of, again, the, the capital, the type of capital that the upfront funder is using what was really interesting is, is the data that that pie chart that was shown um, how there's still a lot of work to do in terms of figuring out what is the remaining kind of capital, a lot of unidentified information. Um, but what was fascinating to me was that there was some information saying that some kind of equity uh, was being used. Um, and then also the debt piece on the equity. To me, that still is curious speak for, for at least a couple of reasons. The first is if, if an upfront funder is providing equity for a service provider, um, that's not necessarily appropriate for working capital um, in terms of they just need the money to to start uh, doing what they need to do in order to generate potential returns, I guess, on that equity. Um, it just doesn't really make sense in terms of what the, the capital is needed for. Uh, it's not really a long term type of an investment type of opportunity. So equity in that sense um, is curious. The second aspect of equity, which is is not very clear to me, is if it's a nonprofit type of entity, it's impossible to actually take an equity stake uh, to begin with. And a lot of the service providers are nonprofits. You can't purchase equity shares. There's no such thing as an owner. So that also is curious. Um, certainly, there are for-profit social enterprises. So perhaps that is what is happening. That's not uh, very clear. On the debt piece, um, in terms of the risk sharing or, or, or where's the allocation of risk, the only thing that could make sense to me is if it's a forgivable loan where if the service provider still doesn't achieve its targets, it's not on the hook to pay back the loan back to the upfront funder. Um, and in that case, the upfront funder maintains that risk. If it does perform um, and the loan does have to be paid back, with interest, then that obligation probably goes to the outcome funder. Um, and so as a legal obligation, the upfront or the service provider probably never takes on any kind of legal obligations. Um, that would probably be the only structure as to why debt might make sense. But that begs the question, why make it that complicated? Why is it that, um, you know, why is it necessary to even provide capital, again, working capital to the service provider in that form of a forgivable loan where you have to uh, have the, the obligation is taken on by a third party, as opposed to just provide them with the upfront capital they need via some form of a grant. So that some interesting observations there. Thank you. Um, I, I cannot pick you up on this, Jonathan, <laughs> because I think this, uh, I looked into it, and um, in the end, it sort of made sense for me for administrative simplicity to structure it this way. And uh, I mean, you might laugh at calling it simplicity. Um, but I think the reason behind this at the beginning when these structures were created, there was a desire of um, attracting different type of investors, not just the philanthropic organization that were given grants. And uh, in fact, when philanthropic organizations that give grants play a role in, in impact bonds, often this is seen as, as a substitution effect. We, we used to call it a grant before, and now we call it a social impact bond, maybe because, I don't know, it's more fashionable, but there is no more capital coming to the sector. We will not achieve more outcome. So I don't know. I I wonder if the idea of designing a structure that is closer to those who work in the like the, in the traditional financial sector was one way to say, oh, this is a another way in which you can use your capital and using their language that was possibly helpful. We have a lot of investors that now are impact investor, but it was deleterious because uh, uh, the outcome payer say, well, this is. We are not there to help people making returns. And so like he brought in some players because that was their language, but it uh, scared others off thinking like, oh, we don't want to have anything to do. So it's an interesting balance. But I need to stop here. If you have any comments, please put it in the chat because in eight minutes, we are reconvening 
for uh, our social. But before we do that, stay online if you want to, uh, to join the social, everybody is welcome. I'll uh, pass it over to Shri, who's telling us what's happening next. Thank you, Mara. Um, so I'm going to share the slides again. Um, so I'm going to share some of the next steps. Uh, the first one is our Slack channels are, has been like very active for the last two weeks. So continue um, sharing your comments after this show and tell and continue on working on it. Um, and also it's a great way to keep in touch with your team. So the next step is um, we also have, um, we'll be writing a blog. So if you're interested in to contribute to the blog, like let your challenge leader know. And there are samples of the blog in our website as well. Uh, so the last but not least, uh, Mara already mentioned this. We have a social event right after. So it's going to be the same link. The only thing that we kind of request people to bring or wear is Indigo. But don't worry if you don't have anything still, like come and join us and we will continue the conversation. And yep, thank you. Back to you, Mara. Thank you so much, uh, Shri, and I want to thank you, everyone, each one of you, for joining uh, today and for participating in this uh, Hack and Learn. Those uh, Hack and Learn really help us improve the data we gather and how we present this data. And I will stop here because you only have six minutes to improvise with something indigo for those of you who will be back here. I will stay online. I'll just hide my screen, so then I will reveal my Indigo gadget. I'll see you in six minutes and uh, thank you again very much. In particular, thanks to Harry, uh, Jonathan, Juliana, who led the challenges and uh, to Elaine, who spared uh, the time today.